Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Katherine Eisenhart. I'm Associate Professor Emerita at, here at UIS. For those of you who don't know me, it's because y'all came after I left. <laughs> I am honored tonight to introduce Dr. Richard Gilman Opowski. He is the Associate Professor and Chair of the Poly Political Science Department um, and his focus in teaching and in research is political philosophy. He is the author of four books, uh, Unbounded Politics, Spectacular Capitalism, Precarious Communism, and the book that we are going to uh, be discussing, the theme of the book we're going to be discussing tonight is uh, Specters of Revolt. I need to tell you so that you know I have read uh, Spectacular Communism, uh, Spectacular Capitalism twice, Precarious Communism only once. I have to read Marx before I go back to that one, and Specters of Revolt three times. Um, each has challenged me to think and rethink about my beliefs and what I think and the theories I have and the ideas I have about both my nation and the world. And now may I present Dr. Richard Gilman Opowski. gotten that first. Well, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Catherine. Catherine, um, before she retired, was one of one of my uh, favorite colleagues and remains one of my favorite colleagues. Um, and not only because she reads and rereads my books. Um, I mean, that's that that would have to be a small part of it. But but uh, but there are many other <clears throat> there are many other good reasons. And I, I should thank you all for uh, for coming tonight. Um, it's a rainy, possibly thunderous evening. Um, but I hope that we have a good uh, discussion. And I think that if it's a very good discussion, um, that you'll be able to pick up a copy of the book um, if you'd like to read a bit more about my theories and that this work that we'll be discussing briefly tonight. Uh, the bookstore is um, not yet uh, here with books, but I believe that they'll be coming and hopefully they'll be there by the time we're, we're finished. Um, so, Specters of Revolt. Specters of Revolt is a book about how this world, our world, is haunted by the possibility of its transformation. The specter is a happy haunting. The specter of revolt is good news, but for unhappy reasons. Our world, governed as it is by money, is a world of catastrophe. Of course, and I hope that you don't need me to, to tell you this. There is in this world also joy and love, human solidarity, hope, triumph, and I hope that all of you have a good deal of that in your lives. But by too many measures, and for many billions of people, this is a world of hostility and total insecurity. Some of you may have seen in January, several months ago, Oxfam put out a new report, Oxfam 2017, correcting the data that they published in 2016 about inequality in the world. 
And what they told us was that there, we made some mistakes last year. It was then much worse than we reported, and it is now even worse. Oxfam, not some communist, radical, revolutionary organization, reported several months ago that eight men, not as philosophers say men sometimes in the 19th century to mean everyone, eight men own the same wealth as the 3.6 billion poorest on earth. Since 2015, the richest 1% has owned more wealth than the rest of humanity. This just confirms information that's been coming out of the Paris and London schools of economics for decades. And in the book, I don't talk about this report, but I, but I do talk about uh, recent reports from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, that say much the same thing. The oldest problems of poverty and inequality, instead of shrinking, are growing. We also live in a world of ecological danger. It's something to think about. Uh, overshadowed on November 8, 2016, by one particular event in this country, was a meeting of the United Nations COP22 in Morocco, in which they gave very best, was a U United Nations climate conference in which very bad news was published about the ecological catastrophe on the horizon being much closer than anyone hopes or previously thought. Something else that often gets ignored, especially by my group, political scientists, who could make a practice out of ignoring very important things all of the time. We live in a world of depression, of loneliness, of anxiety, our schools and workplaces are often, to use the term of an Italian philosopher, Franco Berardi, factories of unhappiness. And these things have been studied around the world um, in various ways by social psychologists, mostly outside of the US. Not good news. It's within this context that I have undertaken to study revolt to look at revolt as a rational and reasonable response within and against the world as we know it. But what is revolt? Revolt is a kind of politics, but by other means than conventional politics, and it may include many things. It may include social upheaval, Various forms, including riots, insurrections, civil, uncivil, disobedience, the disruptions of protest and social movements, among other things, including the occupations of buildings, parks, workplaces. What revolt does across its diversity of form, many different forms that it takes, is it tests the boundaries of law and often breaks the law, but not by accident, because it largely grows out of a disaffection with legal channels. So revolt emerges historically at precisely those points where legal cha channels appear bankrupt, stilted, blocked. It isn't the case that revolt that people who participate in revolts have never tried to make use of legal channels. That's one of the most common mischaracterizations. Every society, including ours, is haunted by the possibility of revolt. Every society worries about the possibility of its destabilization. Specters of revolt not only threaten to disrupt everyday life, but also to excavate buried questions that haunt societies with long histories of exclusion and violence, among other misfortunes. 
Revolt takes up the unfinished business of previous revolt. Revolt is never finished and done. When it's over, it isn't over. When a revolt ends, it isn't over. For example, from the many North American slave revolts of the 18th and 19th centuries to the race riots of the 20th century, from Springfield, Illinois in 1908, to Watts, Los Angeles in 1965, to recent uprisings in Ferguson 2014 and Baltimore 2015, to the Black Lives Matter disruptions at the Mall of America and Minneapolis Airport in Minnesota in December of 2015, to the Charlotte Revolt in North Carolina in 2016, there is always some part of the revolt that expresses grievances carried over from the past. And so also, revolt is never as spontaneous as it seems. Another common um, caricature of the revolt is that it appears to have come out of nowhere, that it has no history, that it's random and spontaneous. But sometimes things that look spontaneous are in fact not. The title of my book, Specters of Revolt, alludes to two major thinkers separated by a century. First, the title alludes to Karl Marx, who happily announced another happy haunting in his mind. In the Communist Manifesto, he announced famously, quote, a specter is haunting Europe. The specter of communism. Marx saw this as a happy ghost, a happy haunting. He perceived that the present in 1848 was haunted by its future abolition. So he looked at the time, the present time, and he said, the present society is haunted by its future abolition. So he's the first marker. The second, a hundred years later, is Jacques Derrida, French philosopher. Jacques Derrida wrote a book called Spectres of Marx in 1994. It was published early into the post-Cold War period. Now, what does that mean? So, in the years from 1989 to 1991 was a major transition around the world, often referred to as the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War. And in the early 1990s, much of the humanities and social sciences, certainly the whole discipline of economics turned away from Marx so as to say that this is the death certificate of Karl Marx. The end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, could be nothing but the tombstone for Marxism. And so here comes Derrida in 1994 when most of the people in his field and others to, had declared the, the permanent death now of Marx. And he wrote a book called Specters of Marx in which he thought about the ways that the 21st century would continue to be ha haunted by Marx's ideas. Certainly, as I said at the beginning, the fact that inequality today is greater than Marx could have imagined it being over 160 years ago. The Oxfam numbers I gave you, the growth of inequality, these are things that Marx did not believe would continue to haunt the world, but they do. And so Derrida said, well, the Cold War is over and Marx is long dead. And the 20th century, Derrida argued, seemed to vindicate Marx's claim from the 19th century about the specter of communism, because many people look at the 19, I'm sorry, at the 20th century as being 
as uh, Eric Hobsbawm called it, a short century, bookended by the First World War on one side and the collapse of the Soviet Union on the other side, so roughly 1914 to 1991. A century framed by this big standoff between capitalism versus purportedly communist or socialist governments on the other side. So Derrida said, well, Marx was right that the 20th century was haunted by the specter of communism. Um, politics after the Second World War was, was basically defined by this, um, by this uh, opposition. But he said that now we will see new ways that Marx haunts the 21st century. So what I've tried to do is to bring these two spectral theories together, that of Marx and of Derrida, and to argue instead that the 21st century is haunted by specters of revolt, but not necessarily specters of communism or specters of Marx. Because the revolts that we see and that we have seen and that I will discuss in more, some more detail in a moment in recent years, they are not fully or clearly communist or Marxist. One could make a very ideological reading of a revolt anywhere in the world and say, ah, that must be the revolutionary working class, but it would be ideological distortion. Because a lot of the recent revolts we've seen, particularly in the US, a lot of the recent black revolt in the US, for example, it's not clearly consciously fully communist or Marxist. So our societies aren't, I don't think, haunted by the specter of communism, as Marx said, or by the specter of Marx, as Derrida said, but by a specter of revolt. Now, I don't use the term ghost to specify anything supernatural, and that has to be said pretty quickly. Now, you may, you may want to talk about celestial ghosts or supernatural ghosts, and I don't want to take away your, conv your, um, your convicted uh, faith in those, but I'm not talking about those ghosts. We begin with the question of what a ghost or a specter does. What does a ghost do? What does a specter or a ghost do? Its primary and defining activity is to haunt. That's what makes the ghost a ghost. That's what makes the specter a specter. To be haunted is to be troubled by the presence of something that one feels or knows to be there. So ghosts are typically understood to haunt particular locations, objects, or even people with which they're associated in some intimate and historical way. So if you go to New Orleans, for example, and you go on one of the many ghost tours you can take in New Orleans, what you will see are, well, you'll be shown where all the purported ghosts who lived in the servants' quarters or as slaves in particular um, uh, homes in the French Quarter, when they, are, when they haunt that city, when they haunt the downtown, when they come out to haunt the downtown. And in the book, early on, I give a kind of catalog of how these ghost stories map out over all kinds of terrible and awful things that humans have done. The most haunted places, what are they? What kinds of places are they? Prisons, asylums, sites of war, defunct castles with all, you know, where, 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 where many people perished to build. There's a whole long list. Ghosts, uh, all of this to say that the ghost haunts a place that it's associated with in an intimate way is pretty conventional to the common definition of ghosts, but it can be used to describe the normal experiences of being haunted by other things. For example, by the bad things that you do as a person. I know that everybody in this auditorium would be able to say things that they've done that haunt them. Maybe you said something to somebody at one point and it haunts you that you've said it. You wish you could take it back. Maybe something was done to you, sometimes something very awful and it haunts you. 
things that you've done that have been done to you can haunt you. And this is on a personal level. Sometimes when we speak of our baggage, your baggage, my baggage, we're talking about our ghosts. Being troubled by a memory or a traumatic event, and all of you, each of you is capable of naming these ghosts, the specific ghosts that haunt you. You may not want to tell me, especially if we've just met, but you know what are your ghosts. Hopefully you have few, if they're bad ones. They don't have to be bad. They, they don't have to be bad. Um, but these ghosts affect your life and your relationships. It's another way of saying that not everything that has happened has been finished and resolved. Something happens to you. Something happens in your life, but it continues to haunt and to affect your, your relationships with other people around you. That's how a ghost works, and it's always the case with revolt. Revolts, like in the recent examples of Ferguson and Baltimore and Charlotte, they are difficult to predict. But as soon as they happen, the reasons for their occurrence are easy to see. What I have found in my research is that actually the hardest part of understanding a revolt isn't why it happened, but why it didn't happen until now or in that particular place. When you look at some of these recent killings of unarmed black youth in this country, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Michael Brown, Freddie, Freddie Gray, Keith Lamont Scott. I'll talk about a number of these cases in a moment. They're not the only ones. These killings are happening at a startling and astonishing rate in this country. I think you'll be stunned when we get to it. So why a revolt in Ferguson and not some other city? Why a revolt in Charlotte? So they're surprising but in a different way than you might think. They're surprising because why didn't they happen? Why are there so few and far between? Why aren't they happening more? Or why aren't they happening in different places? Revolt is difficult to predict. That is true. But surprising doesn't mean inexplicable. When you are surprised by something, that doesn't mean it's irrational or inexplicable. We never think a revolt is possible until it happens, but then, when it does, we're forced to ask what will happen next, and each side has its imagination. Some people who are worried about the revolt are immediately afraid of all the awful things that will come from it, but then others have a different way of imagining what could come from it. I claim that revolt raises the most important questions but that we can only hear those questions if we are willing to consider the rationality of the revolt. That we have to be willing to think about its rationality, to think about it as a form of thinking. One question that revolt definitely raises is the question of violence. And this is something that I, I hope we can talk about tonight. Those who condemn revolts, like to say that what they are condemning is the violence. That's what they like to say. They condemn the revolt and they say, well, what, I understand a grievance there, but what I don't like is the violence that comes in the revolt. But the violence of a revolt is minuscule by comparison to the quotidian violence in between them. So the word quotidian is worth thinking about for a moment and defining. Quotidian, since I don't use a blackboard, I'll spell it. It's Q-U-O-T-I-D-I-A-N. Q-U-O-T-I-D-I-A-N. The word quotidian refers to that which occurs every day, which appears to us as ordinary, or so much a part 
of the daily expectations that even though it, it may be awful, it has become mundane. So the quotidian conceals a lot of awful things. If you want to think about some, some, uh, some, some, some uh, uh, examples, you could say, um, I'll talk about a number, but one of them it would be a person who's become accustomed to an abusive relationship. Oh, that's just how she is. That's just how he is. It's normal. It's quotidian. And so it appears like something that ought to be accepted as normal, not questioned as awful. This is a, 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 a makes it banal. It's a banalization of, of something awful. Something awful happens enough and it's, and it's regular. You come to expect it. And so you can't even notice. And sometimes you could go look this up. I'm not going to talk about the case of like Stockholm Syndrome and all of that. But if you want to go look, you can, you can look those up. Sometimes awful things become mundane. Sometimes things that you shouldn't accept, you come to accept. Sometimes we tolerate the intolerable. Sometimes we accept the unacceptable. And one of the reasons why I like a political science and theory or political and social theory that deals, that brings in psychology is because it enables us to understand the, 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 the complex consciousness at which we accept emotionally and psychologically things that would be politically or morally unacceptable. If you were asked if it was acceptable, you would say no but you might accept it nonetheless. Now, this quotidian concept helps to also understand how much of the West looks upon violence in the Muslim world. For example, an attack in France is somehow more extraordinary than an attack in an airport in Turkey or an aerial bombardment in Yemen or an attack in Mosul. The latter of these you may not even be aware of. But when the victims of an attack are not, you don't think of them as, as, as it being normal or quotidian for those cities or peoples to be targeted, it stands out. And it doesn't hurt if you can relate to how they look or act culturally or or, or if you can have some kind of an identification with the victim. But this is also how much of white America looks upon poverty in black cities. It's something to be expected there, in the black city. So it doesn't take you by surprise. Even if it's unacceptable, you accept it partially because of its quotidian status. That it's the normal poverty the normal impoverishment. And so we don't necessarily, when it comes to Baltimore, stop to think that Baltimore is one of the poorest and blackest cities in the US, in one of the wealthiest states in this country, Maryland. So I, I suggest that the quotidian, therefore, it conceals, even though often very thinly, an everyday racism, a quotidian racism, or we could just say the normal racism. That is, that is to say the racism you don't see. Now, not everyone doesn't see it. And those who look at revolts from a defensive quotidian perspective, they always find their biases confirmed. So if you take a quotidian perspective, it's normal there, it's normal in Turkey, it's normal in Mosul or Yemen, but not in France, not in the UK, not in New York. When you take a quotidian perspective, you always find your biases confirmed when you look at the revolt. A broken window, looted food, a burning bank, a burning car, they're all terrible forms of violence from the perspective of property law. But from what perspective is the police killing of Amadou Diallo, Oscar Grant, Abner Louima, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, 
Laquan McDonald, Jamar Clark, Keith Lamont Scott, and so many others called violence. From what perspective is that called violence? The window, <laughs> that is a condemnable violence. That's the violence. That's the violence. It's sometimes horrifying how much property law has held our sense of justice captive, hostage and captive. Actually, this is something that Jacques Derrida, who I mentioned before, who, who happened to be one of my, my teachers uh, before he, he, he died. Um, this is one of the things he talked about. He wrote and spoke at Cardoza Law School about the, uh, in French, the word is droit. It means both law and right. And he said that the problem with the concept of duat is that it wants us to accept what is legal for what is right. But in fact, when we deconstruct the law, we find that a lot of times the law became a law through extreme forms of violence that then later on it could not recognize as violent at all, or would not. It could, but would not. And so the question of what is right has to be separated from the question of what is legal. And unfortunately, property law has held hostage too much our concept or our capacity to think what is right. Now, on August 9th, not, long, not far from here, about an hour and a half's drive south, two, 2014, on August 9th, Michael Brown was killed by a police officer. You may have heard about the Ferguson Revolt. You may have heard about Michael Brown. But did you know that he was the 668th person killed in the US by August 9th in 2014, but police in the US killed over 1,000 people in that single year in this country? 1,209 were killed by police in 2015. Freddie Gray was one. There were some, there were indictments that finally came through to say that he was, in fact, killed by police. There was some dispute about that. 1,151 were killed by police in 2016. The 2017 numbers are being counted daily, not on the news. So literally, undisputably, between every killing you hear of, there are thousands, thousands that you don't. Thousands of others, and these others are like ghosts. The victims we know the ones na whose names we know, the ones I just mentioned, they're usually the names of those who were killed in cities rocked by revolt. Revolt sometimes tells you about, because that's what makes it newsworthy. Not the killing itself, but the revolt. Police brutality is a violence. It is a violence. And it's a violence that revolt confronts, something we could see as far back, at least, in the case of Rodney King and the 1992 LA riots. So those who are willing to think about revolt have to consider the quotidian violence, the everyday violence of the situation, and not all of a sudden be concerned about violence only when it suits their ethical disposition. To think about revolt seriously is also to reject all efforts to reduce every uprising to the stories of the individuals who triggered them. So we could go on and on about the names of these people. But we know that the so-called Arab Spring was not about Mohammed Boazizi, the Tunisian street vendor, who lit himself on fire in December of 2010 as a form of protest against the conditions of life in Tunisia being a street vendor, food vendor, 
This is called self-immolation. It's a form of protest. You cannot reduce the Arab Spring to the unhappiness of a single street vendor in Tunisia. We have to try to see the violence in the conditions that made this act of self-immolation appear sensible to Boazizi. What would make him think that this was a rational thing to do? His sister, we should think with her. His sister, Boazizi's sister, asked, quote, what kind of repression do you imagine it takes for a young man to do this? So treatments of particular cases matter, particularly from the perspective of the law. We have to deal with particular cases. We've got to seek justice within those parameters. But even justice in a verdict, as in the indictments of the six officers responsible for the death of Freddie Gray, it does not resolve any of the everyday violence of the existing society. If it did, the numbers would not be going up since the indictments of those uh, guilty of Freddie Gray's death in Baltimore. Now, in the United States, liberals and conservatives, despite other differences, which you would think if you were watching the news media recently were very major differences, massive, irreconcilable differences, They are of one mind in many things. Many big things, huge things. Yeah. Which is the party that's critical of the carceral state? There, you won't, it's not there, right? But they are of one mind, certainly on the question of revolt. Do you remember Donald Trump's, do you remember when he was accepting the nominee, uh, the, the nomination of the Republican Party, what were his three words repeated over and again? The theme of that? That's it. Law and order. Law and order, which were directly and repeatedly attached by Trump in that speech to the context of recent police killings and the movement that has become known as Black Lives Matter. So in the U.S., liberals and conservatives, despite other differences, mostly minor, uh, that doesn't mean unimportant, by the way. Don't misunderstand that point. They are of one mind in characterizing revolt, and there's a usual triumvirate on the, triumvirate on the question of revolt. It's always the same three things. One, irrational. Two, violent. Three, ineffective. That's it. The same triumvirate on the question of revolt. Irrational, violent, and ineffective. Political scientists, you would think maybe would do better. Catherine mentioned I was the chair of the political science department. So technically, I ought to be selling you that you'll get these kinds of nuanced insights in the political science program, but you will not, okay? Now, you can talk to me. Of course, you'll get those from me. Now, I only know the tiny things I know as something about. Everything else I don't know about, which is most, most everything. But what I mean is, political science also generally accepts this ridiculous caricature of revolt. And I argue the total opposite on all three scores. And we could talk about that if you want to. But what they mean by democracy is the procedure of elections that function intermittently with the input of a near totally passive demos. Political scientists and liberals and conservatives in this country are very commonly, when they think of democracy, they think of uh, basically, you know, democracy, the word democracy, demos means people, krasi means power. Now, what passes for democracy is a totally passive demos. Near totally passive. And the input of this demos in the democracy, you call democracy, can be almost no input, too. Elections don't require a very active demos. Very small percentages of the electorate participate in them. Very small percentages. Oh, I know you know about the November 8th, 2016 election, but what about the one 
last week. Where your weight can be most felt, you are most absent. And that's not a criticism of you. It, it's, a, it's a long historical, cultural, political, and also economic problem. The, the, the absence of the demos in democracy, this would have confounded Aristotle. Aristotle wouldn't have been afraid of democracy if it meant what it now means. He wouldn't have worried about democracy. He would have said, that's okay. And, uh, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in The Social Contract famously said democracy would be the best form of government if, if men were angels. Because he imagined the demos controlling everything. But our, our concept of democracy is, is decisively uninterested in both a form and content in what is actually called democracy in the long history of human societies and political philosophy. Um, <clears throat> so even in the big elections, very small percentages of the electorate participate. And sometimes a small percentage of that already small percentage determines the outcome. So you can have like 62% of the electorate turnout, and then you can have less than half of that decide the outcome for the victor. You can. You don't have to go far back to old examples either. So unless we want to say that we'll only be able to hear the demos speak if it speaks in ballots, then we might also try to hear the demos in other activities, like the activities of social upheaval. I think democracy is there in Baltimore. I think democracy was in Iran in the summer of 2009, when Western commentators said, where is democracy? I said, look, there it is in the streets. I think democracy is in the anti-democratic, underneath the anti-democratic regimes of people like Mubarak and Morsi in Egypt when it enters Tahrir Square. And if we don't want to think about democracy in that way, then we will have none of it. One of the nice things about a revolt is that it also points out the deficits of so-called democracy raising questions that the procedural apparatus totally neglects. For example, when racism and police brutality became major themes in the last election, it was revolt that made them so. When Sanders and Clinton argued about, in the primaries, police brutality, it was revolt in Ferguson, in Baltimore, that put those questions onto the agenda. Not that that's any promise of favorable policy outcomes. And when Trump, at his nomination, uh, at the Republican nomination, talked about law and order, why was he talking about it? Because of the revolts, the recent revolts, that haunted that whole election, you know, was haunted by the specter of revolt. That whole election, and even now the administration, you might say, that could be a different discussion. For example, um, so these things are, are examples. There are many other examples also around the world that you can look at. Um, and in the book, I should be clear that I, t I look at uh, a lot of non-US examples. Often the seeming spontaneity of, revol spontaneity of revolt, like it looks like it just came out of nowhere, is what masks its rationality and reason. Because the iconic image of the reasonable is that it's calm, objective, and carefully presented. This is called, in my field of philosophy, this is called epistemology. And epistemology is about what looks like knowledge. What is knowing? What, does, what form does knowledge take? And, and you are taught in classes at UIS time and again that, <clears throat> that reason is corrupted when you have subjectivity when you don't have care and calm. And, reason, and revolt doesn't look reasonable in this scientific way. Revolt is unsettling, it's subjective, it's unruly. It's a mess. It really is a mess. So revolt for that reason is typically characterized as the opposite of thinking. That's why you see 
all of the time, commentators, whenever there's a revolt in any city, talking about this unthinking, spontaneous, irrational violence. And then they always want to get somebody in front of the camera to say, what's your agenda? Make it a numbered agenda specifically that everyone signs at the bottom. Otherwise, it's irrational. It doesn't have any rationality. So revolt is, tip, is, is tip, typically characterized this way as an emotional outburst, some, something that's entirely destructive, condemnably violent. This old and ongoing characterization rests upon the familiar idea that reason should be dispassionate. Reason is dispassionate, purely objective. And you can't be reasonable while being affected by anger. You know, sometimes if you're in a relationship, your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever says, something terrible to you in a fight, and then later on they say, it's not what I thought because I was angry. Do you believe that? There's no truth in the content of the communication when it's delivered in the context of anger. It might be, might have been the only truth you got that year from your lying <laughs> lover. It might have been. Now, maybe they regret that they didn't say it in a different way, more constructive, more productive. But in the context of the calm, the content would be lost. In the context of the calm, it's not there. In the quotidian, in the quotidian life that you live with your loved ones, much of the truth is concealed. I also think that this characterization of revolt stems from a misogynistic scientism that degrades and disqualifies subjectivity and feeling. I'll tell you about epistemology. Um, for me, when I was in college, I took a course called Feminist Epistemology. And it was a very eye-opening course because it showed this long history of women who had experiences doing things that men did not have experience doing. like bearing children. And it showed how in this, in, in this class and also in a book of the same name, Feminist Epistemology, how all of this women's knowledge was written off as old wives' tales. And you know, the, the doula, the, the, the woman who, mostly the woman who comes in with a birth experience to the hospital, it was a long fight to get into the hospital because medical science refused to recognize that there was knowledge there. It's too subjective. Ah, oh, what has she done? She's only had three children. What would she know about the science of childbirth? That's a very common, uh, it's changing a bit, but what, what changes it is a long history of trying to think about different forms of knowledge that can appreciate subjective experience that people have. So I think that when you look at a revolt, as opposed to seeing something macho there, this, this imagery that sometimes you see of riots and revolts of, of, um, of, of men throwing bottles at police officers and things like that, actually the most powerful imagery for me when I first started to do research on this subject as a PhD student was seeing photographs of the Zapatistas in Mexico, photographs of, sh of these uh, women, short Mayan women, five foot two, standing down these soldiers from Mexico City. I thought, well, that's interesting because it, it challenges this idea that the standoff is macho. It also challenges the idea that, this, that, the, that the, the knowledge must be objective and that subjectivity has nothing to teach us. So exploring the reason of revolt and even more the notion of revolt as reason challenges widespread assumptions about how reasonable persons act. It challenges the common claim that good thinking must always be dispassionate and also challenges the image of revolt as, ma as a masculine physical confrontation of macho powers. If we unpack the critical content of revolt, it produces new understandings of what thinking is, what thinking looks like, what thinking may be, and about how and where thinking happens. Not always is it in the university. Sometimes it's in the streets. 
But this calls for a reversal of perspectives commonly held in both society and, so and science. In society, this calls for reversals of perspective on the notions of practicality, violence, and irrationality. I would ask you, if you're convinced by any of these arguments, to, to participate in the reversal of that particular perspective. As members of society, when we see a revolt, unruly, messy, scary even, I would invite you to think about how it raises questions about irrationality and violence and effect. I think we could see, all of us, I believe we can see revolt as a practical response to various forms of quotidian violence. We could see it as a response that usually makes sense and typically makes good arguments too. It was very strange for me when I was studying the Zapatistas to see how people said, why did they have to make a revolt? Why did they do that? Why couldn't they do a different thing? Well, in Mexico, by that time, you had over 70 years of one party rule. And they were the indigenous population, very massive and very un unhappy, and they were trying all kinds of things. And then finally, when there's a revolt, the question is, why did they do it that way? Couldn't they keep on living in oblivion, as they called it, unheard, invisible. What good is rationality if it cannot even be seen? In science, this calls for reversals of perspective on notions of objectivity, intelligence, and analysis. I say, in your capacity as a student, as a professor, a student, you could think this way too, about what doesn't get considered or taken seriously in your classes. I would like to see more social scientists, political scientists, looking at revolt as a form of speaking, speaking by other means, as, a, as the activity of a general intellect at work, helping us to understand the real problems of the world. We can understand problems from, a, from paying close attention to a revolt that were previously not understood very well or at all. So now, drawing to a close here, in between every revolt, we are haunted by the specter of the next one. In between every revolt, we're haunted by the specter of the next one. The most recent revolt is never the last. In the introduction to my book, I talk about the concept antebellum, the time before the war. And I suggest we talk about ante revolta, that every time is ante revolta. Every time is antebellum too, but a war is not a revolt. It's something else. In the possibility of revolt resides the possibility for rethinking and to be very optimistic. You know, I opened with some bad news. Let me close with some good. I believe that in a revolt we could see the possibility for rethinking and remaking the world. Revolt does not solve all the problems once and for all. It may not solve any of them, but it tells us that there's a real desire for a different world that can express itself in powerful disruptions of our upside down reality. It does a lot of other things that we could talk about if you want. Effective things that change relations and change people and change their understandings of themselves and the world around them. Revolts do that. And there's quite a bit of evidence that, it, that they do. Globally, revolt has com been communicating this to us with greater frequency in recent years. So the specter of revolt haunts. If it is not now happening, we know that it will. Thanks. <laughs>